This CKNW podcast for AIM Medical Imaging, home of AIM Medical Imaging full body MRI scanning. A family history of medical issues is nothing to ignore. Book a preventative screening at aimmedicalimaging.com. I'm glad you're with us. I've uh, been looking forward to this all week to get uh, Bert Doman on the line with me. Bert, uh, DomanCapital.com. But of course, I knew him when he started the Wellington Letter. Gosh, I think it's. Uh, 1980, 1977, I know Bert's been involved in the market, so we've been trying to get him on the air with us. He's got a, a, a book out called Coming, The Coming China Crisis, so there's a lot of things to get to. Bert, first of all, appreciate you finding time for us this weekend. Uh, good morning. It's uh, my pleasure. And, and let me just start with this sort of big question right now, which is, you know, here we've got the economy in the States and in Canada and obviously in Europe. Nobody would call it robust. You can get some mixed signals, but, man, I was looking at 90 million Americans aren't working any longer. I mean, for a variety of reasons, but, my goodness gracious, uh, as I say, you've got now the housing bubble there or the housing start, the recovery seems to be uh, slowing down somewhat. The, as I say, variety of problems, yet you get the market at record highs despite things like debt ceiling debates. What, what gives out there? Well, uh, first of all, the economy, you know, I think there's a, a great uh, misconception out there amongst economists. Most economists are predicting uh, economic growth. They're looking at uh, small signs that say, oh, here we go, the economy is strengthening, which is all uh, phony. It is not true. The economy is actually weakening, if you know where to look. Uh, earlier this year, in the first half of this year, everyone was talking about a strong retail sector uh, because retail uh, sales had risen But uh, that was not actually unit sales. It was price increases that were reflected in the sales. If they would report unit sales, I'm sure there was no growth at all. In fact, the people should also look at inflation-adjusted numbers. This is very important. When you see in economic statistics, always ask, is this inflation-adjusted or not? Because that tells you the real story. Right now, the most uh, uh, important indicators for us have always been at times when there is big, big disagreement amongst economists of where the economy is going. We look at consumer spending. Consumer spending actually topped out in May. It's been declining ever since. The stock market normally tops out along with consumer spending. Right now, that is not happening. We're also seeing uh, bank loans, bank credit, starting to decline here over the last several months. And this is amazing because of the huge uh, inf- uh, the influx of money from the Federal Reserve. They're putting $85 billion, with a B, dollars into the financial system every month. That's $1 trillion per year. And it is not doing anything to uh, uh, boost lending from banks. But these are uh, science to worry about. Then, of course, we all know what's going to happen next year, and that is you know, uh, basically uh, people that work for larger companies Many companies have already said that uh, they will downsize people from 40 hours a week, the regular work week, to 29, so that uh, they don't fall under the Obamacare Act. Uh, So that means that uh, many people, millions of people, will get a 25% pay cut in their uh, in their check, in their uh, paycheck every month, and uh, you know that will obviously affect uh, consumer spending. Suddenly, you you can't even pay the rent if you get that kind of a cut in your income. And on top of that, the, uh, the health care costs will be tremendously higher. Even the government uh, estimates that the average male will have a 99% increase in his health insurance costs. Uh, women, I think, are around 60%. So we, we see all of these headwinds coming, but the stock market is rising. The stock market always reacts to financial stimulus. There's excess liquidity creation, $85 billion per month. And that goes into the stock market in the form of speculation. So you can still make some great profits here over the next two months in speculation. That's not investing. Uh, let me come to something like you had a terrific track record. Uh, you wrote a book, for goodness sakes, called Prelude to Meltdown. That was in 2007. In the book, you said, hey, watch out, 2008. You're looking for you know sharp decline in the markets. And, and I guess the big question, and you've just sort of started to answer it there for us, Bert, which is, you know, what about the exit strategy for individual I- I investors? Uh, as you say, this is so dominated by politics and Federal Reserve policy and not necessarily fundamentals in the market uh, that I think a lot of investors, as you say, are, are kind of nervous. 
uh, but they don't see alternatives in the fixed income market, so they're in the market. What kind of context can you give for them? Yeah, you know, Michael, uh, thank you for pointing that out. My book, Prelude to Meltdown, was written in 2007. I never wanted to write a financial book because it's just drudgery, and uh, really you don't make any money on a financial book. But I wrote wrote in the preface, I said, uh, 50 years from now, economists will be talking about what will happen next year and why nobody saw it coming. And I want to at least put it down in writing that uh, one person saw it coming. So I said 2008 will be like a 1929 we will see a global financial crisis, and, uh, and uh, whether they will be able to stop a meltdown or not, we couldn't know at that time in 2007. And as we uh, know after the fact, after 2008, Chris Dodd, um, you know, the, uh, um, the politician in Washington, he said, actually, people don't realize that. I was at a conference where he said this that we were 10 minutes before shutting down the banking system of the United States. He said that. So uh, it was really critical. And it was easy to see. And uh, for next year, I think it's relatively easy to see also what is going to happen to the economy. But investors shouldn't go up. You know, in downturns, in market declines, especially sharp ones, you can make more money than in bull markets. And we did that in 2008. You know, we recommend it uh, uh, in September. September 4th, we recommended five ETFs, inverse ETFs. They rise when the stock market or the sector declines. And they were up an average of 72% over the next six weeks. 72% gain in six weeks. So you can make a lot of money in market downturns. So don't stick your head in the sand. Don't use the ostrich method of investing. These are great opportunities. You're going to have some great opportunities going into year end, and I think you're going to have some uh, great opportunities next year on the other side of the market. And, and uh, again, talking about exchange-traded funds, that's one of the reasons, Bert. I just think people have to become aware of the opportunities provided because it's a different game. It's a much easier game today than, say, 20 years ago. Uh, you know, we just came through the anniversary of the 1987 crash. We didn't have exchange-traded funds. It's much more difficult to play that down move. Today, it's very easy with exchange-traded funds, and I, I really invite people to do that. Terrific. I'm talking... I'm talking yeah, with Brett Doman. It's really, it's really uh, terrific. Uh, these uh, inverse ETFs are wonderful. You don't have to think about uh, short selling. The ETF does it for you. I'm talking with Bert Doman, Doman Capital Research. Uh, you can find him at domancapital.com. Doman is spent D, spelt rather D O H M E N, D O H M E N, domancapital.com. I'll come back more about the markets, but I also want to check with him about China. He's written a book called The Coming China Crisis. He's just updated it uh, and keeps a close eye on it. I've been traveling there. We'll talk more about that when we come back with Bert Doman on the Chorus, on the Chorus Radio Network. Broadcasting today to news from News Talk 770 in Calgary because tomorrow we have the big seminar uh, coming up. By the way, at the seminar, there's going to be lots of great people. Tyler Bullhorn is going to be uh, kicking things off. Steve Duchesne speaking about exchange-traded funds. Chad Wazilinkoff will be with me in just a couple of minutes on the air. Andrew Rulin. It starts at 9 a.m. Plus, of course, uh, later in the afternoon, I'll be uh, hosting a VIP function with Jack Crooks, Victor Dare. Uh, as I say, uh, all, the other, all the other sessions are free, but I would really encourage you to go to the VIP session, learn about the currency and the currency trading market, and with ETFs, by the way. Just go to moneytalks.net. Make a plan to be there tomorrow. Bert Doman is on the line with me right now. Very interesting. Bert's been in the markets for 40 years looking at this stuff. Had a terrific track record, especially in terms of getting his investors out of the market. And, Bert, if you allow, before I come to China, I want to just come back to that for a sec. So, basically, are you going to be just looking for a shift in Federal Reserve policy, or do you think the market's reaction to the existing policy will sort of just run its course and just sort of by whatever method it just comes down it's not uh you know because the federal reserve just isn't the biggest game in town anymore yes you know uh it's a good question uh actually i think that whole uh, thing about uh, the federal reserve reducing stimulus that we uh, heard during the summer was really just what we call job boning they never intended to reduce the stimulus uh, because economic conditions uh, don't warrant that uh, I think uh, they're not going to withdraw any stimulus for a long, long time. Uh, the only reason that they would have is because 
the Federal Reserve is basically now buying up all the Treasury securities. And tre Treasury securities are very important in the financial system as collateral. So if the Federal Reserve ends up owning all the uh, uh, Treasury securities, there's nothing for the private sector to use as a collateral. But, of course, we have these huge deficits in Washington that need to be financed, so they will be creating many more Treasury securities that can be used. I don't think the Fed is going to reduce the stimulus. In fact, if there's any move at all, they might increase the $85 uh, billion stimulus to, uh, uh, to 100 billion stimulus uh, next year because the economy will be weakening. And I think that is the important thing to look at. Let me, uh, speaking of uh, countries that are under a challenge, let me come to China because you wrote the book, The Coming China Crisis. That's a big issue, especially in Canada, because, of course, China has been a main driver of commodity prices. And Canada, you know, has avoided a lot of the pain we've seen in Europe and uh, pain we're seeing in the States because of the commodity uh, boom. But, of course, so if China is going to have some problems, that spells problems for Canada. So could you just elaborate what's worrying you most about China at this point? Well, in China, the whole economy is, is, is phony. All the statistics are phony. They're, they're reporting 7.5% GDP growth. Uh, if you just uh, take out the governmental sector and just look at the private sector, in, in our work it shows that they're at best at 0% growth. And possibly the private sector is in a recession already. They had a terrific credit crunch in June of this year when short-term interest rates suddenly went from 7% to 25% in one day. Uh, so they had a real serious credit crunch right now. According to our information, small companies cannot get any credit at any bank anywhere in China. So all you've got in China right now is governmental stimulus, infrastructure programs. They're building, uh, what is it, I think 34 million uh, apartments uh, for uh, the people, low-income people, and so on. Uh, so that uh, creates a lot of demand for raw materials, cement, uh, uh, stones. They're now, uh, uh, you know, the, this is good for Canada because a lot of lumber from Canada is going uh, into these uh, apartment complexes. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is not a uh, real stimulus. Uh, uh, I think uh, in, uh, one symbol of a top is always when a country builds the world's tallest building. In Dubai, it was in 2007, with the Burj Khalifa. And at the time, um, we wrote in the Wellington letter, we said, uh, Dubai is going to be the biggest real estate fiasco in the history of mankind. And it was. Uh, they eventually defaulted on all of the loans. Uh, actually, it wasn't called the default. They just agreed with the banks to postpone the payments for six years. And when the six years are up, which is coming up now, they're probably going to extend it another six years because the banks don't want to write these loans off because that, uh, the banks don't have a sufficient reserves on their books to take such write-offs. So everybody agrees, okay, let's just postpone it, and then uh, they pretend that everything is fine. But in China on June, uh, July 20th, that the groundbreaking of Sky City, which uh, was going to be the t tallest uh, building in the world, bigger than the one in Dubai, uh, and uh, was scheduled for completion in 2014, next year. Uh, but the government, our latest information is that the government has stopped the construction on that. They told the developers, stop it. We don't want this thing to be built right now because there's a huge surplus of office space already. And this, uh, the stuff that's coming onto the market over the next several years, the, all these buildings are going to be empty just like in Dubai. In Dubai, the office buildings are still 70 to 80 percent vacant. Uh, so uh, in Dubai, they have a terrorist boom, but the office sector was way overbuilt. So this is what we're seeing now. We're, we look at electrical consumption. We look at freight loading. We look at um, uh, um, export, uh, shipping rates. Take a look at the shipping rates. You've got the Baltic index, which uh, everyone looks at, and that, that's been rallying here over the last couple of months, but it's still in the trading range. But a much more important one is the Har Harper's index, which uh, actually is for container freight. These are pr uh, finished goods or uh, semi-finished goods. Much more important, it looks very, very sick. We're right back to the levels, to the lows of uh, 2009, which was after the world's biggest financial crisis in 60 years. So we look at all of these things. If the government were not putting a stimulus uh, or these uh, infrastructure programs into the market, uh, there would be a big recession right now in China. And you can also tell, look at the, the retailers, look at the Yum Brands, the restaurant chain from the U.S. 
that owns Kentucky Fried Chicken and Pizza Hut, etc. You know, every quarter for the last five quarters, disappointing results, disappointing sales, disappointing profits. They always uh, uh, blame uh, China. You've got Coach uh, with the with the bags. You've got Tiffany's. You have all these major luxury brands. They're reporting sales drops of 20 to 30 percent in China. That does not coincide or does not confirm an alleged GDP growth of seven and a half percent. Let me just ask you, we've only got about three minutes left here, Bert. And I, you know, the bottom line is, you, as you look at the same sort of things in the U.S. in terms of, you know, without the Federal Reserve, what would things look like? Uh, without the actions you've just described by uh, the government in China, what would things look like? But what's an individual to do in this kind of a, an environment that uh, the word manipulative uh, comes to mind? Yeah, well, uh, I think the fr- first thing is, you know, don't... Uh, Believe too much in what the, the guys from Wall Street tell you. That's really tainted advice. Uh, I, I, and, you know, especially in Canada right now, you know, you're very dependent on uh, raw material uh, and commodities. And they may have some uh, big setbacks next year. So be careful. The real estate market is red hot in China. Uh, I mean, in, the, in Vancouver, uh, at least. And uh, that's because of Chinese demand. So be very careful next year. I think next year is, uh, is going to be a year for, uh, for the people who know how to sell short. And uh, I, I think the story that uh, bonds uh, are going to uh, drop uh, very, uh, very significantly, I think it's overdone. I think a weak economy will once again make bonds a good alternative, although <laughs> very low interest rates, right? Yeah, that's an interesting point because you say because the sort of consensus was, and, and I mean, you know, we've got both Federal Reserve and the Bank of Canada saying, be careful, rates are going up. You know, I'm talking going back to May. You'd have those historical drops. So a lot of people had money in the bond market, but it looks like uh, certainly in the Bank of Canada changed the tune this week, and the Federal Reserve looks like it has. So we might even see lower rates. Exactly. And, you know, the one big thing that nobody's talking about is the yen carry trade. You know, everybody's been borrowing the yen here. Uh, uh, because the government has been trying to lower the value of the yen, and it was successful earlier d- this year in doing that in order to fuel the economy in Japan. Well, such stimulus is usually short-term. Uh, uh, over the long term, it backfires. And uh, so everybody, uh, all the big hedge funds are going in there with 100 to 1 leverage, and they're, they're actually borrowing yen in the anticipation that someday in the future they'll be able to uh, pay back the yen with cheaper yen. Okay. So if you do that with 100 to 1 leverage, then they take that money, convert it to U.S. dollars, and buy U.S. treasuries, okay? That's the carry trade. That's how that works. But now just imagine if the yen suddenly rises in value instead of declining further. If for every one percentage point in rise in value of the yen, if you're at 101 to, to 1 leverage, it wipes out all of your equity. Mm. If the yen rises t- t- uh, 2%. You've doubled your losses. Uh, this is tremendous, and can you imagine everybody trying to exit that trade at the same time? The exit is not going to be large enough. Great stuff. Bert Doman, you can find Doman Capital Research, by the way. I knew him originally from the Wellington Letter, which they still publish, plus uh, several other services. DomanCapital.com, D-O-H-M-E-N Capital.com. Bert, thanks for finding time for us this weekend on the Chorus Network. Thank you very much, Michael, and I wish you and your listeners uh, all the best in the next 12 months. It's going, it's going to be challenging. Thank you. Back with the shocking stat of the week. I'm glad you're with us. As I said, I'm broadcasting live from uh, um, News Talk 770 in uh, Calgary. Uh, great stuff. In just a moment, I'll give you my shocking stat of the week. And I think I will shock you. It's a big story that a lot of people haven't quantified. You might know it. Not many will, though. I would bet less than 1%. And then I was thinking, I said earlier that my goofy, you probably wouldn't be mad at me. I was wrong. Some people will be. They will be. Joining me in studio right now is Andrew Rulin. Andrew, welcome. Uh, thank you for being here, Integrated Wealth Management. Uh, you're speaking tomorrow, so I know you've got a busy uh, time the last few days. You're speaking tomorrow at the conference here in Calgary at the TELUS Center. Um, but I wanted to get a chance to chat. We had chatted a little bit ago, and now mm-hmm. we see a different environment. When we came uh, last time we chatted, you said, oh, be careful, there's going to be the debt ceiling debate going on. Oh, be careful, there's going to be more political ramifications dominating the market. Mm-hmm. And I'm just saying, what are you saying to your people right now? Well, basically, 
Uh, it's the same themes over and over again, but as uh, Bert alluded to a few minutes ago, when you've got all of this stimulus, that's what markets react to. So markets probably have um, a tailwind for the foreseeable future. There's going to be dips, there's going to be bumps, but ultimately, you know what? We're in a, we're in a bull market until uh, until we have some kind of major uh, major downturns, major catalyst for the downside. Yeah, until proven proven other words, as we say. I agree. Absolutely. It's it's such a scary bull market because it feels phony a little bit because of all the stimulus. I think Very that's what so. I find difficult personally at my own. And that's why I've said consistently buy dips, buy quality of, in my case, it's yield. Absolutely. You know, timing, is it, yield. timing is important, but quality yeah. is always important, yeah. right? And it, it's so difficult when there doesn't seem to be reasons for things to be in an uptrend. And basically, you, you get in your own way by overthinking. Yeah. Oh, God. You, you, you stared right at me when you said that because you read my mind. That's me. Absolutely. You know, too much information. Mm-hmm. So I come back to these kind of basics for myself to, to move forward. Uh, the other thing about quality, though, is I, I make this distinction. I have to remind myself what the distinction is. We just talked earlier about China, talked earlier about the U.S. Mm-hmm. That's a government problem mm-hmm. that on a shorter term can spill over for sure when it hits the credit markets. But I think it is a private sector world. Mm-hmm. And as you can imagine, people who see the world through some other lens don't like that. But the mm-hmm. evidence is just overwhelming at this point. Yep. That's what I also think that stock market moved. So a quality company can survive the government disruption I see coming in the States, in France, you know, we've already seen it in Southern Europe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's not that there isn't going to be volatility. The fact is, is that the volatility is part of the price that you pay for get the premium return, but you got to be prepared for a few bumps. Now, good asset selection, some good timing and a little bit of trimming here and there can take the sharp edges off. But if you want the return, you know, you need to put up with a little bit of the bumps. Now, as I say, I don't want to take uh, steal your thunder here, but tomorrow you're speaking. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are you speaking about tomorrow? I'm actually going to be speaking about happiness and how happiness relates back to our success with money, mm-hmm. and uh, and some of the keys to uh, the keys to happiness. Yeah. Give me one teaser. Oh, one teaser. Oh, um, what is the one common theme that all of the scientists and the spiritual traditions of the world have? Uh, agreed upon uh, that is critical to success and happiness. So if you want happiness, you come tomorrow, tell us center. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, of course, in Calgary, we're talking here. Just go to moneytalks.net right now. You can go today and uh, just sign up. Uh, you can come in here, Andrew, and talk about the prices right. It's free. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's pretty good. Mm-hmm. We are doing with uh, a VIP section later on with uh, Jack Crooks, with Victor Adair. We'll be talking about tr- uh, currency trading, risk management, that kind of stuff. The other thing, though, um, your wife is coming. Janet is coming. She's speaking about health care, which is, you know, a big subject for me. Absolutely. Um, Janet Ballard is the, um, she's the founder of Proactive Healthcare Advisors. And what she's going to be speaking about is parent care planning and some of the, the key things to watch out for. When you think you about, must know what happened to me all summer. I mean, I shouldn't say it in that way. It was a very it's a very difficult time. Absolutely. When you have that. Uh, now, is there anything more important to most people than their family? The answer is probably no. Mm-hmm. And if the answer is yes, well, they probably have other things that need they need to be looking <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> at. But the fact is, is that uh, the issue with aging parents and looking at uh, dementia and declining mm-hmm. physical health and the family dynamics and the social aspects and their housing aspects. Those are critically important issues that um, so many people are dealing with. But because as a society we've not dealt with this no. aging population before, we don't know how to do it. It's also politically not comfortable because it changes the dynamic of how we've taught politics for the last 50 years. Mm-hmm. I'm proud to say, by the way, I included that over 10 years ago as the key element in financial planning. Mm-hmm. It's your own health. Yes. And how are you going to handle and help with your parents and that? So it's going to be very interesting. I look forward to seeing you down there tomorrow. You'll be there with bells on. Integrated Wealth Management, Andrew Rulin here in Calgary at News Talk 770. I'll take a break. Chad Wazilinkoff is going to be here. I've got a goofy award. Oh, my shocking stat. I can't leave you without that, baby. Wait a second. Here's my shocking stat of the week. We've got 105 senators in this country. What they're expected to do is work three days a week for only 29 weeks a year. You know what their salary is? $132,300 plus, and here's the plus, plus expenses, plus pension. Senators 
are employed until the age of 75, but they can retire as young as 55 with 75% salary. They also get 64 round trips in Canada per year, $20,000 travel allowance if they live over 100K, 100 kilometers away from Ottawa. That reminds me of the Roman Senate at this point, but 132 grand. That's, and let's face it, for some of them, attendance has been abysmal. But even if you attended, this was so funny because yesterday they met on a Friday and every newscast I heard said, oh, they're meeting on a Friday. They're actually working on a Friday. They get 1517 bucks a day if they come every time there's something in session. That's 29 weeks, three days a year. Uh, this is, uh, well, I found that shocking. It costs Canadian taxpayers over $106 million dollars per year, but that doesn't include contributions from taxpayers to their pension plan. I was in shock when I read that. Coming up, my Goofy Award. Wait till you hear this one. But next, I got Chad Wazilinkoff from Fortress Paper. Stay with us. Coming up, Victor Adair speaking about currencies. Victor and I will chat about some of the action there and the opportunities there. Plus, I've got a Goofy Award for you. Right now, very pleased to have with me uh, here in Calgary at News Talk 770. Chad Wazilinkoff is here, uh, CEO of Fortress Paper, uh, had a terrific track record of looking. This is the thing that Chad does that I love, but I don't think it's ever been more appropriate in the market, which is he looks for situations and companies that are out of favor. He has a contrary approach to it. And it's always interesting to talk to him and uh, things he's done, success stories, that kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, boy, has it ever been more important, Chad, because I can tell you, first of all, thanks for coming in, by the way. No, thanks for having me. But, uh, but I, I can tell you, you know, you look at the market, the valuations feel awfully high in some areas. So we're all sort of detectives, if you want to buy something, looking for something that maybe the crowd hasn't discovered at this point. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of where I've spent most of my time looking for investments or opportunities, this uh, contrarian type of approach. So while it seems like good times, there's a lot of robust things going on, and obviously things that dominate the media would be Apple and te uh, Tesla and things like that. There are still always industries going through really tough times, and I'm not talking about you know gold happens to be down a little bit from its highs and things like that, but actual physical hardcore manufacturing industries, uh, PC manufacturers as an example, everyone's obviously using the computer more and more and using emails and uh, applications and wireless and mobile but the physical PC makers continue to decline. They sort of miss the boat with these tablets, everything's shifting to iPads. So again, there's, there's niche opportunities within even growing industries. Uh, you know, it's interesting. How do you know the difference, though, between an industry uh, that really, you know, it's down for a reason. If you imagine their chart, it looks like a down staircase, but it's not going to recover. You know, I mean, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but things that just, you know, maybe became obsolete. Uh, and an industry that's on hard time, so it's got the same thing, but has recovery potential. Yes, absolutely. There's, uh, you know, it's fairly easy to uh, pick the two apart. They both, obviously, as you said, going through tough times, steep decline rates. Ideally, you wait till they stabilize near the bottom, and then you look at the underlying fundamentals. Uh, so whether it was the buggy whip, and obviously uh, being replaced by cars and things like that, it didn't matter if you were the best buggy whip manufacturer. It's just not coming back. Yeah. If you look at newsprint now, again, everything's going digital, media, newsprint in a huge bear market, uh, tough, tough times. You can pick up a mill for a dollar and multiple mills for a dollar, in fact, but it's still not a good place to invest. Again, what you need is the underlying fundamentals have to be there. Uh, one of the Do you start with saying, uh, is there still a market for this product? Forget how they're producing it. They may be incompetent, may be competent, who knows, but is there going to be a market? Because I love the newsprint. Yeah. It doesn't mean paper's out. No, exactly. So you know? one of the ones that was really obvious to me uh, back when uranium was 8 9 $10 a pound, been in a 25-year bear market. Nobody had been looking for uranium. It's a very expensive and uh, long process to extract. But the reason it was in that type of bear market was due to the decommissioning of warheads in the Russian uh, state. So they kept oversupplying the market, but even they were talking now about keeping it for themselves. They were running out of stockpiles. Again, nobody had been exploring. Prices have been too depressed. It's not commercial or economic at those kinds of rates. So a bull market had to happen. And, you know, I started a uranium company right around that time, able to pick up great assets, really hard to find uranium experts because nobody had been uh, yeah. in that space for such a long time. But yet nuclear was growing. The demand was growing. And, you know, it was just a matter of time. 
Okay, so tomorrow you're speaking uh, down at the TELUS Center here in Calgary, and you'll be talking about contrary investments, some of the stuff you're looking at. Give me a little preview of a couple things that have caught your eye. Uh, you're, you're not recommending them. You're just saying this is where you're doing some exploration right now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, I'm, I'm looking for these contrarian, out-of-favor investments, but also paradigm shifts. So within industries, there can be these niche breakout things that uh, are, are going to turn an industry on upside down or on its head. One of them, it's a combination, I guess, of two, is uh, 3D printing. Mm-hmm. And obviously the way that's going to change manufacturing around the world and one-off uh, products, you don't have to mass produce these things. Did you make too many? Did you not make enough for the demand? Trying to predict. Uh, but also kids' toys, believe it or not. I find uh, it's a great growth industry. The margins are spectacular. And similar to the way Apple went back uh, and obviously changed the record industry or the music industry, we all used to go into record stores or CD shops, had to buy the physical hard product. Well, my view is longer term and focusing again on toys, eventually you're just going to download the, uh, the print schematic, so to speak, print it off. It allows to actually be more complex toys created because you print in hard uh, mm-hmm. surfaces, but also dissolving surfaces. So you can have these inner workings and gears, dunk the printed uh, 3D product in water, dissolves, now the working gears uh, are operational. So again, you can produce it cheaper, you do it at home, you can pick your own color scheme before printing it, and the margins obviously are spectacular. So I think over time, the the toy companies, if they're not on the ball, they're going to miss out, similar to the way uh, the record industry changed. I think uh, this is an opportunity I am looking at and diving deeper. It won't a lot of work to be done, but uh, one of the one of the interesting spots I see. Well, that's an example of the kind of thing you'll be talking about tomorrow. And I, I man, I want to sign up right now. I'm telling seriously, I just love that kind of stuff. I love the way you think about it. Uh, if you had more time, I'd go into some of your track record of doing this kind of thing. But I think that's where it's at in the investment markets right now. That's what every private equity firm's doing. You know, they're looking for these opportunities. I invite you to come and hear Chad Wazilinkoff tomorrow at the Telus uh, Convention Center if you're around the Calgary area. Absolutely make a point of doing that. Uh, you know, and later on, I'll be doing a VIP session with Jack Crooks, flown up just from Florida, Black Swan Trading, Victor Adair. I think you should know about, uh, I think you should know about trading occurrences and the opportunities there. But the whole uh, session before is absolutely free. You come down, but you have to sign up on moneytalks.net to get your ticket. So do that. Go to moneytalks.net. But Chad will be there. I'm going to be there listening to you. Chad, great stuff. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. I'll take a break. I'll come back. Victor Adair and a goofy. Stay with us. Hey, I'm glad you're with us. Victor Adair joins me on the line right now. Victor, how appropriate that you'll be talking about currencies when I look at all the currency action uh, going on right now. I mean, $5 trillion trades a day. I, I shouldn't be surprised, but man, it seems like there's some volatility and opportunity. Volatility and opportunity and also some surprises, Mike. As you probably know, the euro currency is trading to a two-year high against the U.S. dollar. It's at a four-year high against the Canadian dollar. I think that's a direct result of the, the major theme of market psychology right now is that the Federal Reserve is going to just keep on printing. In other words, there's going to be more and more U.S. dollars out there, in effect, diluting the value of the U.S. dollar You might look at Europe and think, man, is that ever a disaster waiting to happen? How could their currency possibly be rising against the U.S. dollar? But it is. Well, this is the thing I love about the currency trading opportunities is that if you have an opinion, like I think Europe is uh, in trouble or I think uh, Japan's in trouble or I think this is good or bad, you've got to play it through the currencies. And you can do that with exchange-traded funds or the futures. But it's that's where the currencies are really fun to have a look at. I think the currencies are very, very key. There's obviously a huge amount of money that flows through there. Uh, a lot of the currency markets around the world traded with a lot of leverage, and that can add to the volatility in the markets. It, it's something that I've really paid attention to and traded a lot of my, I mean, my, my whole career, really. I, I love trading currencies. I've said on your show before, if I had to be restricted to just one market, I'd trade the currency market. Well, you'll get to do that uh, tomorrow in Calgary. Uh, you know, uh, it's going to be great at the Telus Center. You're with Jack Crooks. I mean, people can come and get, you know, a lifetime of experience. And I know you're going to share with them really some stuff I, I, that I think is key for investors to learn. They don't have to wait, you know, spend the money you did to find out about it. I think it's going to be a great presentation, great opportunity. I, I'm really looking forward to it and looking forward to what you say and what uh, Jack's got to say. Mike, what I'm going to do, basically, I've got 10 key questions that I ask myself just to see if I'm doing everything I can to try to be a better trader, including 
the thing that I think is the single most important key that you have to do if you're going to improve your trading performance. Then I'll take a, a look at a number of the currency markets and apply those keys and talk to the folks that are there about what I think is right now my very best uh, trading idea in the currency markets. So uh, come and meet Victor Adair, of course. Uh, all you have to do is go to moneytalks.net. He's part of the VIP uh, session there, uh, a session that only costs you $99 to get a world of opportunity. And as they say, Victor will talk about his latest trading, but also, I think more importantly, the risk management skills he'll bring to bear on it. Victor, look forward to seeing you there. I look forward to seeing you too, Mike. Have a great weekend. Just go to moneytalks.net. Time now for this week's Goofy Award. I'm always interested in what the public and the media focus on. This week, of course, there was tons of attention on Mike Duffy's accusation that the prime minister was in the room when he was instructed to pay the money back or, or Elsa. And, of course, they waited with bated breath to hear Pamela Wallen speak. And I'm happy they both got their say. But the level of coverage, I think, tells you more about the interest on the part of the media than the fact that three senators have been forced to pay back expenses that weren't eligible and did the prime minister know when and where and all that stuff. I mean, it's just such easy stuff to report on. It doesn't take uh, any depth at all. And I, I agree. I mean, the Senate sp scandal is infuriating to many of us, but it's really small potatoes, especially given the money has been paid back. I know we're supposed to be interested in the political machinations around it all, but uh, aren't there a lot bigger fish to fry here? I mean, for me, the real goofy is this. If petty politics really does turn us on in the media, to this degree anyways, then we're missing a far bigger scandal. I'm not talking about 109 arrests in the Quebec corruption scandal, the $1.1 billion the Ontario Liberals' cancellation of two power plants strictly for political gain caused. I'm talking about the Senate itself. Every appointment in that Senate is a payoff for some sort of party in power. I mean, Mike Duffy and Pamela Wallen, what were they there for? To help raise money for the Conservative Party. I mean, the senators aren't appointed on merit. They're not, you know, they're appointed for some service they render to the party in power. In this case, it's Conservative, before that, the Liberals. And it costs us $106 million bucks per year. For what? Because they serve the interest of the government in power. To me, that is a far greater interest than a minor expense scandal when the money's been paid back. I invite everyone to have a look at that one. That's all the time we have. Glad to be here. My thanks to people at News Talk 770 in Calgary. Thanks for listening.